My name is Mike Rosen, and today I'm going to tell you about a problem that I see as one of the really great problems today in biology, and that is how eukaryotic cells are organized on micron length scales. Now, I'll begin by telling you that eukaryotic cells are organized across a huge range of length scales, from the organization of individual atoms and protein molecules, to the assembly of those proteins into larger and larger uh, complexes, to the organization of those complexes into distinct subcellular compartments, out to uh, membrane-bound organelles in cells, out to structures that, contain, that consist of the entire length of the cell. And what I'll propose to you is that we understand the organization on the shortest and longest length scales quite well. So in the shortest scales, we understand a great deal about how macromolecules function through uh, uh, decades of structural biology and biophysical studies. On the longer length scales, we understand through cell biological studies um, many of the membrane-bound compartments of the cell, for example, the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, the mitochondria. Um, all of those are very well understood in terms of their structures and functions. However, there's an intermediate length scale, <clears throat> um, roughly 100 nanometers to microns, uh, on which we understand the organization much, much, much more poorly. Because there are in cells many structures of this size um, that are not bounded by membranes, that consist of, of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of individual macromolecules that are involved in many distinct areas of biology. And I'm just showing sort of a, a panel of those, a representative panel of those uh, structures here. So, for example, there are some structures, um, uh, the junk and the iPod structures, that are involved in protein quality control. There are structures in the nucleus called PML nuclear bodies that are involved in DNA repair. There are puncta of various uh, metabolic enzymes that have been observed in yeast and um, higher eukaryotes that are believed to be involved in controlling metabolism somehow. There are puncta of numerous signaling molecules, such as the disheveled protein here, um, that are involved somehow in mediating signaling activities. There are RNA granules of various flavors, for example, these stress granules, which are involved in translational control. There are also uh, numerous structures that, that uh, exist in the domain that are in, in, in the nucleus that are involved in organization of chromatin, which are believed to play an important role in gene regulation. So these micron-sized, membraneless structures are found really throughout all of eukaryotic biology. Um, but we understand very little uh, about their functions. We understand a lot about the individual molecules that control, that, can, that are uh, contained within these structures, but we don't understand why those molecules or how those molecules are brought together into these micron-sized structures to impart new functionality uh, to cells. It turns out that there are also a number of, of potentially analogous structures that are two-dimensional, that is, clusters of proteins on membranes. And those, again, are important in, in very large swaths of biology, and I've just listed a few here. Um, uh, the immunological synapse, focal adhesions, invadopodial structures, the initiation of invadopodial structures, are involved in T-cell activation, cell migration, tumor metastasis. Um, and again, like the three-dimensional equivalents, we know very little about uh, the nature of these structures and their functions in cells. So, <clears throat> there are a, a series, I think, of, of uh, fairly discrete questions that we would really like to know uh, about these structures to fill in the gap between macromolecular understanding and membrane-bound structure uh, uh, understanding. So, uh, first, uh, what is the physical nature of the structures? What are they? What are the molecules that compose them? How are those held together to give a discrete structure? What are the biochemical and cellular functions of these, of these uh, cellular structures. And then sort of two corollary questions, how do the physical properties uh, dictate the biochemical and cellular functions? And then finally, how can uh, the physical properties and thus function be controlled by cells uh, to organize various uh, biological processes? So uh, these, I think, are, are a fairly straightforward set of questions, but they're all very difficult questions. Let me spend a few minutes explaining to you uh, some of the challenges in understanding them. And I think a lot of those challenges can be illustrated by comparing um, uh, a macromolecular assembly, even a very large one like the eukaryotic ribosome shown here, to, a, let's say, a generic cellular punctum, these micron-sized membraneless structures. So one of the first points of comparison that one can make is the size. So even the eukaryotic ribosome, which is a gigantic macromolecular machine, 
when you really scale it to the size of one of these cellular puncta, it's minuscule. So this is the size that a 25 nanometer ribosome would be uh, compared to a one micron uh, in diameter cellular punctum. Perhaps even more importantly though, not only are these much, much smaller, but the size of a macromolecular complex is fixed by the components that compose it. Whereas these cellular puncta, the sizes are highly variable. Sometimes they'll be small in cells, sometimes they'll be large. They can transition from large to small in response to different perturbations. Let me take the ribosome back up to uh, an unrealistic size to make my additional comparisons. Um, the composition is also very different. Um, macromolecular complexes are usually of fixed stoichiometry, such that there's always one copy of this protein and one copy of that RNA. However, the composition of the cellular puncta is highly variable. Molecules go in and out of them. Some molecules stay, some molecules go. Um, they also are very different at the level of structure. So macromolecular complexes are stereochemically defined across their entire length. So if I know where this amino acid is at one end, I know the organization of that amino acid at the other end of the molecule. However, these cellular puncta are almost certainly not defined over their entire lengths. And in fact, we don't know on which length scales they are stereochemically defined and over what scale that definition decreases as one moves out. Um, they also are very different in terms of dynamics. Much biochemistry of macromolecular machines is governed by fluctuations on microsecond and millisecond timescales. Whereas in these cellular structures, yes, the molecules within them move on those timescales, but the molecules also move within these structures and also between these structures and the surrounding media on timescales that are much longer, seconds to minutes. And frankly, it's really unclear at this point which of those timescales of fluctuations are most important to the function of these structures. Um, and finally, I think one of the most important issues is function. So we know that macromolecular machines function according to the domains that compose them. Whereas it's really unclear in these cellular structures what functionality can be specifically ascribed to the assembly itself. Again, it's distinct from the function of the individual proteins within them. What does it mean to organize them into this much, much larger structure? We simply don't know at this point. And finally, regulation. Um, we know that macromolecular machines are regulated often by alterations between dis discrete configurations, the inactive state and the active state, for example. However, because we don't understand the functions of these uh, cellular structures, um, it's unclear really what should be controlled. What should we be looking for to understand how function is altered by cellular processes? Now, because of all of these uh, difficulties, we really need new conceptual frameworks and new experimental tools to understand these micron-sized membraneless cellular structures. And I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes um, uh, a little bit about um, um, some ideas that I and others in the field have had about these. So there are a couple of potential frameworks, conceptual frameworks, that derive from polymer science and soft matter physics that may play some role here. And one of them is this idea of polymerization, because most simply, if you think, how do you make a big structure from a bunch of little structures, the little structures may just polymerize into make something much larger. And when those assembling structures are multivalent, the systems can have uh, undergo what's called a sol-gel phase transition, such that in, in, at low fractional binding, one gets distributions of small complexes. However, as fractional binding goes up, there's a very sharp line beyond which the system becomes capable of assembling into huge macromolecular assemblies. And it's possible then that this sol-gel transition um, or, or polymerization in general may contribute to these micron-sized structures. Uh, another idea that's been put forward re recently is this notion of phase separation. And so I'm sure everybody's familiar if you mix oil and water together and you shake them up, uh, you can get these, these little oil droplets that will float around an aqueous solution. Well, it turns out that macromolecules, proteins and RNA in particular, can also do this. And in fact, um, as uh, a system polymerizes, as proteins polymerize, they become less soluble, they become more able to undergo this kind of phase separation to produce concentrated protein droplets, for example, in aqueous solution. And so again, it's been proposed that some kind of phase separation may underlie many of these cellular structures. 
Um, I'm sure, though, that with more thought and um, uh, more experiments, there are other concept conceptual frameworks that also um, uh, could be brought to bear to understand these cellular structures. Um, in terms of tools, um, the tools that are used to study macromolecular structures, X-ray crystallography, NMR, electron microscopy, are really best at describing discrete entities or fluctuations between discrete conformational states. However, as I told you, these cellular structures are almost certainly not discrete entities. And so we need new tools that will describe them as distributions of structures, distributions of stoichiometries, and probably also tools that will allow us to, to assess and perturb their material properties, which may play a role in their functions. And of course, we need ways of then relating these properties to the individual macromolecular interactions that govern their formation. Um, <clears throat> in terms of function, Often, in the fields of biophysics and cell biology, biochemistry of purified components is used to understand mechanistically the functions of individual molecular or individual entities. Um, the problem is that most of these cellular structures, in fact, can't be purified. And so we need, then, ways of characterizing their biochemical properties in situ or to reconstitute these structures from their individual parts. And perhaps most perplexingly at this point, we need ways of directly interrogating the functions of the assemblies themselves, again, as distinct from the components that compose them. Um, and we really need new experimental approaches to address that issue of assembly. And finally, we need new theoretical descriptions of these structures. And it may be possible to take theories that exist already in polymer science, colloid science, material science, and apply them to biology. But an important distinction between biology and these other physical sciences is that biology is almost always held out away from equilibrium by the consumption of energy through ATP hydrolysis. And so one then needs to take these um, equilibrium studies and apply them to biology by incorporating this idea of uh, systems away from equilibrium. And um, I know there's, there are studies of active matter uh, in the soft matter physics world that may very well be applicable to biology. So, let me just conclude by coming back to what we would like to know in these systems. Um, you know, what are they? What do they do? How does what they are dictate what they do? And then how can biology control all of this to mediate various biological processes? And so I think if over, say, the next decade we can understand all of these questions, we'll fill in this, this uh, uh, interesting and confusing gap between macromolecules on one end and membrane-bound organelles on the other and give us a, a thorough across-scales understanding of biology. So hopefully I've inspired some of you to think about this problem and hopefully you, over the course of your career, will be able to uh, answer many of these questions. Thank you.